There's no take two. There's no just a little more purple. Warts and all, you've downloaded the VO Radio Show. Welcome to the VO Show. Today our guest will help answer the question, voice actor or sound? His favourite band is Toto. Favourite album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. He always wears red sparkly shoes when he's out of town. From Kansas City, Dan Hurst. Oh, I thought we were talking about my wife. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and from Sydney, a man who needs no courage, no heart, but does need to be lubricated twice daily. Mm-hmm. Robbo, the Tin Man Robertson. <laughs> You're kind of guessing where I'm going with this, haven't you? I think you got an idea. Uh, my name is Andrew Peters, a.k.a. The Wizard of Oz. The connection, Kansas and Wizard of Oz. Anyway. Got it. Got um, <laughs> now, Dan really doesn't need an introduction, but we gave him one anyway because you are mm. well established in the US as a bilingual voice actor or voice over person. That is the question. But before we get to the main question, just for anyone that doesn't know you, particularly in Australia, can you give us like an abridged bio? Well, I grew up in Honduras in Central America, and uh, I grew up speaking both English and Spanish at the same time. I que mi español es lo mismo que mi inglés. So I can just, you know, if I'm thinking in Spanish, I'm speaking in Spanish. Uh, and if I'm thinking in Spanish to try to speak in English, then I come across with a little bit of an accent that comes through, you know. But it's just one of those things that it's just one of those quirks that, you know, I can speak English and I can speak Spanish. And uh, it's done me well in, in the voiceover business. So how did you get into voiceover in the beginning? Uh, like most people, I, I lost my job in radio. And uh, it was one of those things that I couldn't find another job because we're really, you know, as radio DJs, we're not really qualified to do anything else. I, you know, we can't even sell hamburgers. And I couldn't find a job. And one day my wife, uh, we were listening to the radio on, in the car and she said, who does all those commercials? And I just assumed it was DJs or, you know, famous movie stars or something. And I hadn't even considered that there was a, a, an opportunity there. And I pursued it a little bit more and found out that uh, there most certainly were opportunities there. And I went and talked to the only talent agency that was in town. And this is in Kansas City. We were living here in Kansas City at the time. And uh, I uh, asked the talent agent uh, about it and I told him my situation. You know, I, I was out of work and I would like to pursue this if it was possible. And the guy's name was Dick Solowitz. He was just one of the kindest people that I've ever known in my life. And he took me under his wing and... Uh, basically just walked me through the whole process. And a week later, I had my first job. And uh, a few weeks after that, it was uh, one of the uh, studios found out that I spoke Spanish and there was a need for some Spanish stuff. And it just kind of grew from there. And that was some 30 years ago. Wow. It's interesting if you've got a radio background, though, as uh, we all know, um, being ex-radio myself and Robbo the same, is that uh, when you finished your air shift, you used to be uh, taken off to production and handed, you know, a tome of scripts to plow through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, that, that was always, a, you know, <laughs> a good way to learn the craft, that's for sure. Did you find, did you find though, that you really, and this was one of the things that I really had to work hard at, and that is that there is a, a, a DJ style, and we always refer to it, we don't, want to, we don't want you to sound announcery or anything like that. Well, really what they're saying is we don't want you to sound like a DJ. Because there is a staccato rhythm that DJs do, and it's just something that, that they develop, that we develop. Uh, and it has to do a lot with timing because we're timing uh, record intros, and we know we've got 17 seconds to the post and all of that. And so we're so concentrating on time that we develop a style and add to that energy and all of those things that uh, we want to include in our specific persona. Well, you can't bring that to voiceovers. It's just, it's the wrong thing to do. And it took me a while to learn to quit being a DJ in front of my mic. And my wife was really good at telling me, boy, you're sounding like a DJ. You're sounding like a DJ. And and I really had to work hard at that. And part of it was recognizing that I didn't have to project anymore. Part of it was recognizing that I could just talk. I could just be myself and uh, that I didn't have to really sell anything. And as that began to develop, then came the process of becoming that signature voice that that has that style. And yeah. uh, it, it, it is a process. And radio guys have a problem with that. I worked in radio when the FM radio thing got going. And it was kind of like a, it was all a bit sort of audiophile when it first started. So no compression, everyone was laid back. And I was never really a sort of rock jock. I was always kind of a, you know, cruisy kind of jock. So 
the transition for me from being on air to um, to voiceover wasn't quite as dramatic. But uh, I can imagine if you were, you know, like a rock jock, uh, it would be it would be tricky. Yeah. And I remember those days when the jocks were pretty laid back and they were just, you know, it was like they were smoking a doobie all the time. You know, they were just so we laid were. back. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to listen to those guys at night and thinking, wow, that guy is just about to fall asleep, you know, yeah. but it was cool. Yeah. You know, we loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Red eyed and munching pizzas in the studio while the records are playing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The needle was covered in cheese. A bit of confusion there with the pizza and the record. So with the uh, with your your career now, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a particular brand or do you see yourself much more versatile than that? You know, that that's a great question because you have to identify your niches or niche or however you say it depending on what part of the country you're in. And I, for the longest time, was really tackling trying to follow what I consider to be the money. And uh, there were areas that, that were developing for me, but I was really, really struggling to try to get known and to get more jobs in specific areas, national commercials or regional commercials, that sort of thing. And that was really a struggle for me. And then one day I, I did an assessment of my whole business, my whole business model, and I realized that most of the money, about 80 to 90 percent of the money that was coming in was coming in in four specific areas for me. Uh, and it was e-learning, corporate narration, infomercials and car commercials, car spots. But I was spending 90 percent of my marketing money in those other areas that I wasn't getting any work in. So I thought, well, that's dumb. You know, I'm, I'm already I've already got a good client base here. I might as well just market that. And if that's what I'm doing and that's the way it's supposed to be, then OK. And so I started spending a little bit more money, marketing money in those four areas. And those areas actually grew exponentially. And as they grew, then other areas began to develop also. And then what happened was within the United States was this incredible influx and, and realization that the Hispanic community was growing by leaps and bounds. And I got a call from a guy, uh, a, a, a producer down in Miami said, hey, Telemundo needs a voice. And uh, I'd like to submit your voice. And I went, okay, fine. And I didn't really have any television promotional work at that time. So that was all new to me. So I began studying it and what was it that they were looking for? And fortunately, I had people who were willing to coach me along, the producers themselves who were willing to say, this is what we want. This is the style that we want. This is, And they took the time to help me through that. And God bless them for doing that. And so what happened then was that launched a whole new era for me in television and in network programming and radio imaging, you know, signature voice work for TV and radio. Wow. That's a great story. And it's interesting that you uh, realized what your niche was uh, early in the piece, because I know a lot of people go out there and they try and chase down work that they're never going to get. Yeah. Probably one of the biggest mistakes that voiceover people make, and that is not really understanding where their strengths are and spending way too much time trying to improve their weaknesses instead of really developing their strengths to become the standard for a particular genre, uh, the standard for a particular industry. So that if somebody says, hey, we need an e-learning voice, let's go get so-and-so. Hey, we need a signature voice for radio. Let's go get there. You know, here's a here's a list of them. And, and you're on that list because that's what your specialty is. And for the longest time, I never considered myself to be a radio TV voice. I thought it was a commercial voice or a corporate narration type voice. E-learning uh, was coming along at that time, too. And that's all I considered myself to be. And there, as the demand for Hispanic work began to develop and radio stations were looking for a voice, uh, then I started getting calls for that and that started developing. But I didn't chase it. It chased me. And I think that's really, really important to understand. You just have to make yourself available and in the right place at the right time, of course, is an important aspect of it. But uh, when you start chasing something to this is what I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a narrator. I'm going to be an, an in-story narrator for reality TV, you know, that sort of thing. Chances are you're going to end up really hurting yourself in the process. Because it's, it's, it doesn't quite work that way. It's, it's, it's a matter of going where the door is open for you. It's also, the, uh, unfortunately, um, the green-eyed monster that always sits on your shoulder when you do this for a living, that uh, you always see other people doing well and you think you're, you know, you should be doing that. Why am I not doing that job? 
Uh, and in a lot of cases, the reason you're not doing that job is because it doesn't suit you. Yeah. You know, my coaches will tell me, uh, and they've hammered it into me, is look, uh, if you sound like everybody else, why would they hire you? Mm. You know, you have to be so yeah. unique at what you do. You have to have that unique presentation that, you, you know, your voice has to be a little different from everybody else's. Your delivery has to be a little different. So if you do an audition and you sound like 90% of everybody else, if you interpret copy the same way everybody else has interpreted it, why would they hire you? Yeah. Well, we've had a little experiment before, just before we got onto this, um, to record this show. Um, both Dan and I were sent a script from Robbo to read. I don't know whether you've got them queued up or not, Robbo, but... Uh, I do have you, them here. I, I haven't heard Dan's and Dan hasn't heard mine, so I'm kind of curious to see how they came up. I, I should just put a disclaimer in. Uh, mine was quite early in the morning and um, <laughs> uh, I was still a bit a bit scratchy and uh, holding a coffee in one hand. I, I but, personally uh, anyway. think we should go there first, so why don't we do that? Okay. <laughs> morning coffee. And what have we got here? Script from Robbo. <clears throat> here we go. The votes are in. <clears throat> That's a good start. The votes are in. And the first item to make it into the Quartz 1FM $20,000 Ultimate Man Cave is... What's next? You decide. Log on to the Quartz 1FM Man Cave app on 1FM's Facebook page and vote for the most awesome latest tech and gadgets you want in your Man Cave. Every Friday for the next five weeks, Glenn, FD and Andre will give away the hottest item of the week. Then once our man cave lineup is complete, someone will win the lot. Okay, Ugg, just for you, we've got daily prizes of $50 quartz vouchers too. Ugg, don't eat the vouchers. The Quartz 1FM $20,000 Ultimate Man Cave, brought to you by quartz.com.sg. The one-stop store for your man cave. Check out what's up for grabs and enter on the 1FM's Facebook page now. I think I used to work with Ugg. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a bit, bit shaky there. I don't think I get the gig. I hear that red wine haze from the night before in there, mate. Yes, uh, there was a bit of that, indeed. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so that was my... Uh, that was your interpretation? Attempt. It was, yeah. All right. Well, I've got Dan's one here. Let's have a listen to that. The votes are in, and the first item to make it into the Quartz 1FM $20,000 Ultimate Man Cave is... Mmm, LG 55-inch Smart Curved OLED TV. Ugh-like. What's next? You decide. Log on to the Quartz 1FM Man Cave app on 1FM's Facebook page and vote for the most awesome latest tech and gadgets you want in your man cave. Every Friday for the next five weeks. Glenn, FD, and Andre will give away the hottest item of the week. Then, once our man cave lineup is complete, someone will win the lot. Ugg want voucher, too. Okay, Ugg, uh, just for you, we've got daily prizes of $50 quartz e-vouchers, too. Mmm, voucher. Yummy. Ugg, uh, don't eat the vouchers. Nom, 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 nom. The Quartz 1FM $20,000 Ultimate Man Cave, brought to you by Quartz.com.sg, the one-stop store to your man cave. Check out what's up for grabs and enter on 1FM's Facebook page now. Okay, so as a uh, engineer slash producer, I'm going to make the first comment here and say that both of those have equal potential. Uh, uh -huh. Two completely different deliveries. Um, in fact, what would be interesting here is for me to actually play you what actually went to the client from that one. I'll play you that here. Here we go. Okay. The votes are in, and the first item to make it into the court's 1FM $20,000 ultimate man cave is... LG 55 FSD <laughs> Smart Curve OLED TV. $4,599. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you just made you just made my you just made my day, man. Mm, LG 55-inch smart curve OLED TV. Ugh, like. What's next? You decide. Log on to the Courts 1FM Man Cave app on 1FM's Facebook page and vote for the most awesome latest tech and gadgets you want in your Man Cave. Every Friday for the next five weeks, Glenn, FD and Andre will give away the hottest item of the week. Then once our Man Cave lineup is complete. Someone 
wins the lot. I want voucher too. Okay, Ark. Just for you, we've got daily prizes of $50 quartz e-vouchers too. Mmm, voucher. Yummy. Ark, don't eat the vouchers. Nom, 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 nom. The Quartz 1FM $20,000 Ultimate Man Cave. Brought to you by Quartz.com.sg. The one-stop store to your man cave. Check out what's up for grabs and enter on 1FM's Facebook page now. So there you go. That's Singapore for you. Mighty long promos. <laughs> Very long promo. <laughs> they are, aren't they? But look, yeah. uh, in terms of delivery, I mean, Andrew, uh, you know, you were a little more laid back, a little more relaxed. Yeah. Um, and Dan went for the more selly approach. Yeah. Uh, both have their merits. Um, and as you can see, Lofty sort of sits, who did in, Lofty in the middle. voiceover, he sits bang in the middle of those. So yeah. um, without having any direction or input, you know, you both delivered something that could very easily be used. Yeah. One of the things that um, I'm, I'm sure you do this, the same thing, Andrew, when I get a radio station that calls and says, look, you know, we're looking for a signature voice. Would you be willing to do this? Yada, 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 yada. And I spend um, actually about two or three days monitoring the station. I want to hear where the energy is. I want to hear what their perception is of good imaging. And the fact that they're hiring me tells me that they want to make a change, but at least I've got an idea of where they are and um, perhaps I can figure out where they want to be based on the kind of copy that they send me, that sort of thing. And that is a critical part. If you interpret without that kind of research, you are really selling yourself short. You really have to spend time getting to know the client and really getting inside their mind what are they hearing? What are they, what are they thinking? What are they hoping to accomplish? You raise an interesting question here, Dan, and I'm going to, I'm going to put this to you because you have more of an insight into how things are in the States there. But my observations here in Australia, particularly with advertising, not so much with radio stations, but still I do see it occasionally that the client actually doesn't have any idea what they want until they hear it. Well, just recently I was asked to cast for a beer commercial, a, a voiceover. And when you sort of said, when you said to the client, what are you looking for? They'd be fairly vague. It would be, oh, we're looking for a male. We're looking for, you know, this sort of age group, blah, 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 blah. But when you got down to the tin tacks of what type of delivery do you want? Oh, well, it could be a bit of this, or then it might be a bit of this, and then it might be a bit of this and all that sort of stuff. And in Australia, we don't cast for our voiceovers for commercials like you do, you guys do over there. You basically just have a demo. So I got the demo of four or five different male voiceover artists that I thought might be appropriate and sent them off to the client. But the feedback I get from the client is, well, you know, we like, we like a bit of this, we like a bit of that, but we still... So the message I get in the end, though, is they're not really sure what they want to hear until they actually hear it. Well, it's, that's the issue we have in Australia because we don't audition in Australia. That's what I'm saying. So, and that's why I'm interested to get Dan's perspective because you guys do audition over there. You've just mentioned that with radio stations you listen in, but how do you tune yourself into that with agency clients and stuff like that? Actually ask as many questions as I can before I sense that they're getting a little irritated. Mm. Um, I want them to tell me what they want to feel. Mm. You know, when, when that commercial comes on, because uh, uh, they've already seen the copy mm. and chances are they've spent, you know, quite a bit of time already with the copy, far more than I have. Yeah. And so they've read that thing over and over and over in their mind. And they've gotten something in their mind that says that voice uh, is going to work with this commercial. I need to find out what it is that they're hoping that, that they're wanting to feel when this is over with. And of course you always get the thing, well, we'd like something, you know, some a little bit more like Morgan Freeman or, you know, or Mike Rowe or, you know, it's like, oh my God, everybody asks for the same thing. <laughs> but it's really, what is it that you want to feel when you hear that commercial? Not as a client, but as a listener, mm -hmm. you know, put yourself in the listener's shoes. What do you want them to feel? What mm -hmm. do you want them yeah. to think? Mm -hmm. And if it's inspiration is it motivation? Is it, I got to have this? Is it fun? Is it serious? What do you want them to talk about? And I will ask them the question sometimes, what do you want people to say about your commercial on Facebook? That is, is interesting how the kind of response, because they never anticipate that question. They don't really know what they want the listener to say. Mm. And uh, that takes a, a little bit of going through the process of really identifying it. Now, if they've been using an agency, and a creative agency, a creative writer, 
Oh my God. You know, I, I think they are the greatest people in the world. I love good creative writing mm. and a good creative writer makes our job so much easier Yeah, because the truth of the matter is I have to make a decision when I'm given copy. And, you know, you and I, uh, in our back and forth as we were preparing for this, we alluded to this. Are you going to be a voice model or are you going to be a voice actor? And a voice model is very much like a model that fashion model. A fashion model takes her or his abilities to, to walk the runway, uh, to stride, to flip, to, you know, to spin, to do all of those things, to make the fashion come alive, to make the, make the clothes come alive. Whereas an actor creates a character that identifies or, or elicits a response from the viewer or the listener. And so I have to decide, am I, is my job to just model the words, to say the words and to use my ability to make those words just flip and float and fly uh, so that everybody goes, ooh, that's just really cool. That's neat. That's beautiful. Or am I supposed to create a character that creates an image in the listener's mind that elicits a response that, that the client wants. Once we get to that point, the chances are that we're going to create a successful commercial mm. because they don't know it. You're right. They don't know at that point. Do I just want them to, to say the words mm. uh, and, and have really cool music or, you know, or, or really good visuals for TV? Or do I really want them to elicit something? Uh, do I really want something to come out of what they're saying? And sometimes you start off as a voice model, but you create this image in the process of doing that. And at that point, you become a voice actor. Uh, it happens a lot, for example, with me, with English with a Spanish accent. I just did a whole bunch of stuff for the Golf Channel for the Olympics. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to create an image of somebody uh, with a foreign accent talking about golf and what's going on in the golf course so that it wasn't the standard announcers that everybody sees and hears all the time. And so they gave me the copy and they were brilliant writers. I don't know who the writer is that's, that's doing this stuff, but the stuff is just absolutely brilliant. And they said, now create something almost international out of this. And so all of a sudden, the voice, instead of saying tonight on the Golf Channel or today on, in the Olympics, it was today in the Olympics, something very special happened, something magical. And that voice became a character. That voice became uh, acting even though I was modeling the words, I was also the voice actor because I was instilling in somebody a sense of who is this person? What is this? What is this character? What is? And it just captures people's imagination in a way that elicits a sense of connection and perhaps a, a response to what you're talking about. And that was a long answer for your for your for your question. And I really did take too long. But that being said, before I even go into an audition, what what is it that I'm doing? What is it that they want to feel? Do they want a voice model or do they want a voice actor? And how do I create that? And a lot of times I find myself giving them something that is completely different from what their instructions are. And yeah. interestingly enough, sometimes they, they go with it. Or do you, I don't know how this works in, in Australia, but do you find yourselves doing a lot of um, going off copy in, in the audition? Will you do that? Uh, probably, well, we don't audition, um, so that that kind of, you know, we, it's just something we don't do. But um, just backtracking just a bit, though, when you talked about, like, the listening to the radio station and trying to get a feel for what they want, nine times out of ten, they actually want what they've already got, but they just want yeah, to change. I, I, very well said, and it's, yes. Yeah. It's true. And uh, so you end up being the person that they just fired, you know, which is yeah. kind of weird. Yeah. Um, probably us too are similar in that respect. I think we probably, most of our work will be that kind of storytelling model. Which is, um, a, yeah, and, and which is a little more laid back, uh, yeah. and a little more intense. You know, one of the things I, I love about your delivery is that you give your phrase room to breathe. Yeah. And people are so afraid of doing that. You know, voice talents are just like, oh, I got to get through this. I only got 30 seconds. I got to jam this in. Uh, that's a huge mistake. If you're doing an audition, don't worry about the time. That's irrelevant. Yeah. They, they'll work it out. They'll trim the copy. I was in um, New York um, a couple of months back and uh, Jim Canelli from Lotus and myself did a talk at uh, SAG-AFTRA. And part of that talk was there was a script and we had the people in the class go in and read and then we sort of gave them two reads, one that they did and then we'd direct them for the second read. And it was amazing, exactly that, that the people were rushing. And the comment that I used most of the time was, don't rush through it, just open it all up and let the whole thing come to life and let it breathe. 
My dad had a great line one time. My dad is, has passed away, but um, a few years ago, I was visiting him and he always wants me to, to sit in on his conversations with his stockbroker and so forth and so on. You know, I want to make sure I'm, you know, that I'm not getting taken advantage of, you know, that sort of thing. So I, would, I was sitting in on this conversation. I was, and we're on the speakerphone. And he's, he was talking to a stockbroker who was just going off, just rattling off as fast as he could tell him, this is what we got to do this. You know, you can do this. You can burn this point. You can bring this in, you know, the, so forth and so on. And finally, my dad said, stop. I can't listen as fast as you talk. And I've never forgotten that line because that's exactly what happens with voice talent. Sometimes we get so busy delivering the content that we don't give people time to listen and, yeah. and absorb what they're saying. And we make a point. And then before we give them time to really assess that and, and, and absorb it, we're onto something else that's taken their mind off of what it was that was so poignant at the time. Yeah. Here's a question for you though, Dan, and this happens all the time. You get into a session and you get the script and the script is overwritten, but no one wants to cut the script. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course you're trying to fit copy into pictures. How do you make that read not sound rushed when you know you've, you've actually got to cram a lot of copy in? Uh, I back off on intensity. That's yeah. usually the easiest way for me. And instead of, there's a tendency to make, when you go faster, to get a little louder and, and, and to, to, you know, really sell it. You know, it's almost like you become a car salesman. And, uh, and really just the opposite is what you should do. You know, the fact of the matter is, when you think somebody's yelling at you, you tend to back off. You know, you think about it. If somebody's yelling at you, it's because they're probably mad at you. And it conjures up all these feelings of when you were a kid and getting yelled at. And if you're yelling at somebody and, and loud, fast commercials tend to come across that way, you're turning off an audience. But if you back it off, and actually you can speak faster when you're not exerting as much energy. And so all of a sudden you bring it off and you can, you can just go through this whole copy of fairly quickly. You can give just a little pause here and then go on into something else and actually pick up the speed a little bit. And it just sounds a little bit more relaxed because you're not yelling it and you haven't picked up the intensity. And yet by reducing your voice, you can still become very intensive. Yeah. What do you do, Robbo, when you've got a session where you've got a script that's overwritten? What, what's your direction? To be honest with you, my first port of call is to try and convince them that maybe we could lose a few words, <laughs> which is yes. sometimes successful, I have to be honest. My approach in the, in the studio with clients is to sort of take a let's just try it and see approach. So I'll let them get in the can what they want, and then I'll make a suggestion. I'll go, let, just, just humor me, let's try this, or, or words to that effect. And I'll knock out a few words. And a bit like what I was talking about before with that question to Dan about not knowing what they want till they hear it. My experience is that nine times out of 10, they'll hear it and go, actually, yeah, right. Yeah, that kind of mm -hmm. works. In the off chance when that doesn't work, I think you're right. I think you, you've really got to, you've got to do what Dan's talking about. You've actually got to almost suck it back a bit yeah. to create that space. Otherwise, it just becomes this mountain of sound that no one takes anything away from. Can I, can I interject something here? And it's a yeah. little off subject, but boy, it's, it's so important and it's etiquette in the studio. And that is the producer is your friend as a mm. voice talent. Mm. And they know more about what's being done than you do as a voice talent. Mm. And I'm amazed at how often voice talents feel like, well, I'm the creative one, which is <laughs> bullshit. And, you know, the, because the writer is far more creative than you are. Yeah. I mean, voices are a dime a dozen, let's face it. Good writers are not. And so they're already more creative people in that, in that room than you could possibly imagine. And that producer, that engineer is also incredibly creative. They can make you say something you didn't say. Mm. And so as a voice talent, if you will learn to trust your engineer and wait for your engineer's lead, you will be a whole lot happier. I, yeah. You know, that's, I, I'm amazed at how, how bad the etiquette is by so many voice talents in the studio. Yeah. Uh, I just, I'm just, I'm just stunned. It's interesting you bring that up I, because I mean, my approach is that in terms of controlling a room is that everyone has equal input. You know, no, I don't think anyone's idea is any less valuable than anybody else. I think everyone can have great ideas and, and everyone does have great ideas somewhere along the way. But the unfortunate part is that is you've actually got to massage that in with the egos and everything else that's floating around in the room. And that's what a good engineer will do. Absolutely. They'll be aware of that and they'll go, okay, look, if I do this now, this guy's going to get ticked off. But I, if I let him have his head and get what he wants, 
and then sort of throw in a few suggestions, we might have a chance of getting this over the line. And that's, that's, the, um, that's the web you've got to weave sitting in the chair behind the computer these days. I, it's funny it, though, I, I, I tell... can never understand why... Um, sorry, sorry, Dan. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say I'm, I'm amazed that a lot of people actually do allow the talent in the booth to um, have so much power. Yeah, I, I, maybe my casting approach is a bit different, but I, I try to cast people that not only have the right voice for the job, but I know will bring something to the table for that job. And, and you know, it's not a great example, but my ex-wife, for example, is, is one of the more busy female voiceover female artists around Sydney. And that's the reason that she gets a lot of work is because people get her in and they know, okay, not only will she nail what we want in three, four, five takes maybe, but she'll also bring something else to the table. And that's just, you know, feedback that I've had from, from people and also just from experience with working with her. Um, so, you know, I I think your casting approach has a lot to do with how the session is going to go from the very beginning. But the voice talent has to earn that right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And, and it, it, you don't come in with that right. No. Uh, no, of course you know, not. And it's, it's dangerous. I, uh, you know, one of my favorite lines is, you know, when they get into a discussion about what do we do, what we should say, yada, yada, and they go, Dan, what do you think? And I, my answer is, my first answer almost always is, I think you've hired the right voice for this job. Mm. You know, first of all, there's a little levity there. But most importantly, it says, you know, it's not my job. I don't have that right yet. You know, to tell you what to do. First of all, you've got you've got a creative writer there on on your staff that has massaged this baby to come alive. Mm. Uh, you know, w- what do you think? You know, mm. my job is just to interpret it the way that you want me to interpret it, mm. and I trust the engineer to take me there. Yeah. And, and and if the engineer ever comes along and says, "Hey, Dan, what do you think we should do?" Da 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 da. Then I know I've got permission. Yeah. And uh, I, you, I think a voice talent really, really has to depend on, on that engineer and understand that you're just a small part of the whole process. And usually mm-hmm. you're the end of the whole process. Yeah. And that means that you are, first of all, you're dispensable. But secondly, you haven't gone through the whole birthing process of this mm-hmm. creative project. Mm-hmm. And so it's time for you to just to shut up and <laughs> let other people bring you in when it's time. Yeah. Going, going back yeah. to the timing thing, though. If the three of us were in the studio, say Andrew was the client, I was the engineer and you were the voice and we were having a timing discussion, sort of going, you know, is it better to f- speed up or is it better to chop words? Would you throw your hat in the ring or would you still wait for a cue from someone? I would let it go until it was obvious that we've reached an impasse. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I would say, you know, something just occurred to me. What if? Mm-hmm. And, then, and then use that approach. Yep. Yep. But only to bring it off bubble, you know, sure. only to, to say, hey, here's another little extra way to, mm-hmm. to take a look at it and, yeah. and to try this. What, what about that? Now, I do in my role a lot of times because uh, I'm doing Spanish, which has been translated from the English. A lot of times and Spanish is 20 percent longer than than English. So a lot of times we have to do go through that process and it looks like you're going to have to drop this adjective or you're going to have to maybe say it just a little different to get the, the whole idea in uh, or maybe actually say a word in English. You can do that with in the United States now with, with the Hispanic population. It doesn't have to be 100 percent Spanish, mm. but it, it only happens when it's reached that point and it almost never really reaches that point, to be honest. You know, the creative types that have really thought this thing through have said, you know, maybe we should go back to the, what we said before. Oh, well, there you go, you know. Yeah. And so I let them take it and let them create it. And and in the process, I, my job is just to say, hey, yeah, great, fine, I'll try it. Let's give it a shot. It's not my job to go, are you kidding? You want to try this again? You know, I don't, <laughs> yeah, no. I don't have that right. You know, yeah. I, I just don't have... <laughs> permission to do that. And my job is to make it successful. It's not to make it meet my demands. Mm. Or m- yeah. fit your reel, your demo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there is, there yeah. is, a, there is a, a, a few ways of doing it, I must admit. And um, firstly, if, if it is, you, you can see the script's overwritten. Um, you read it as in, in a good pace, so it sounds the best it can sound, and they realise it's not going to fit. And then you try and cram it in. And you do your best job to make it sound the best it can be, but obviously it's rushed. You're probably aware of which words you can lose. And so when you're going for another take, you just make make those words feel a bit awkward. 
and then <laughs> you, you always get a reaction from you know the client saying, "Do you know that the you know the word that word it just sounds a bit wrong to me? I, I, can, can we get rid of that?" Yeah, it's like the old remix button on the on the old analog consoles in the day when you you do a mix for the client and they go, I think the music's a bit loud, but you knowing full well that it was exactly where it should be when it went to air would go, okay, just give me a second, not a problem. <laughs> play with a couple yeah. of faders that had nothing to do with the music at all and then play it back. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. the oldest trick in the book. Yeah. Now, everybody in America seems to be either a writing books about voiceover or coaching. Have you done yeah, either? It does seem that way. <laughs> it does sound like, it doesn't look that way, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. What was your question? It, it, what was your question? <laughs> have you, was there have one? you done either? <laughs> have I done either? Yeah. Uh, I have not written books books about voiceover, no. And I would never coach. Um, uh, first of all, I would never trust somebody who trusted me to tell them how to do it because I'm still learning. <laughs> yes, and uh, I, I have my coaches. You know, I, I have I have actually I have three coaches and uh, they, they specialize in different areas. And I really, I'm just learning. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, but I still have coaches that are developing me and they're listening to me and they're saying, you know what, you're developing a, a little bad habit here. And, you know, you need to pull this back a little bit and, and uh, you need to not be afraid to have a little dramatic flair here, you know, that, that sort of thing. So I admire people who can coach. I am not one of those people. I don't even want to be a mentor. I don't want to get into that kind of situation where, where I feel a sense of responsibility for, for somebody's career. I'm happy to give my opinion and just ask my wife. I'm very good at it, uh, <laughs> but I don't want to coach. No, I don't. And I do write blogs and, you know, that sort of thing for my website and talk about the business, but I don't ever see myself writing a book or about it. Mm. It's always funny. We, we don't really have coaches in Australia. I know there's one here in Melbourne. And she, I think she picked that up from seeing what was happening in America. But we don't have them. And I always wonder whether it would be a really good idea if you have an agent and the agent has the coach on staff to make sure the people on the books are working at their peak. That seems logical to me, but no one's doing it. Yeah. David Lyerly is, is one of my coaches. David was an agent with Atlas Talent. Uh, and interestingly, now I'm listed with Atlas Talent, but that happened long after he was gone from Atlas Talent. And David realized as, a, as an agent that he really liked coaching. He really liked that input with, with the voice talent. And he's good at it. He's, he's brilliant at it. Uh, but I've asked him, I said, you know, would you ever do voice work? Oh, no, I'd never do voice work. He said, my voice sucks. He said, my delivery is terrible. I said, you're coaching people on delivery. He said, yeah, but there's a big difference between hearing it and then coaching somebody through it than hearing yourself. So now what he does is he's hired by a number of agencies, Atlas included, a couple of TV networks will hire him to come in and consult, say, hey, we've got a little, we need somebody to work with this voice talent that we're using for this uh, reality show or, you know, or this documentary. And we're not, it's not quite popping the way we want to. So they'll hire and bring him in to do that. So that is actually a, a precedent that's being set. And, and I think, you know, maybe it's something that you need to introduce to your agents over there in Australia. It'll only make your roster better. Yeah. I'm surprised that Atlas um, uh, have done that. That They're probably one of the best agents in, in the US. Uh, what I love about them is that they don't pull any punches. It's not their job to pat me on the popo and say, come on, you can do this. Come on. You know, you're going to, you're, I'm a big boy. You know, my, it's my job to be my best. It's not their job to make me my best. And so th I appreciate their transparency and, and they'll tell me, yeah, you know what? This sucks. You know, we can't send this in. <laughs> and, and it's not mean. It's just like, Hey, this is the way it is. You know, we, we don't have time to coddle you. We don't have time to go through that whole process of getting you to a particular point. But if they had an, uh, an agent or a coach that they could say, you know what, spend some time talking to, you know, coach's name and see what you come up with on this. That would be, I think, a, a brilliant thing to do. A lot of casting agents in the United States now are doing some coaching for that very reason. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good idea. Well, the thing about the voice, um, you can always direct it. One of the things, the mm -hmm. fundamentals that uh, a lot of people, particularly here, don't haven't got their head around is... It's great to be directed to the voice, but if the environment you're working from is crap, you can't change that. <laughs> That's the um, truth. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So how many uh, voice actors and voiceover people have home studios? How many do you find that are, are of good quality? 
Is that a standard thing for the, the, the people you no, meet? No, I'd say five to 10% have a decent quality, have a good quality. 90% of them have crap. And, and the mentality is, how cheap can I go and get away with it? And I've written blogs about this. I, you know, I've done seminars and talked about this at, at voice conferences. This, you know, th- listen, you don't get anywhere in this business by being average. And if your sound is average, if it's good, you know, it's okay. Good doesn't get you hired. Why would a client hire good when they can hire great? So if, if you're coming in into this business and think, well, you know, I can get a little cheap uh, USB mic and plug it into my laptop and go into my closet and do this there, you might get a sound that might work for maybe a video game or, you know, once in a while, maybe an e-learning project. Or if a client doesn't have very good equipment, they can't tell the difference. You, know, you might get away with that. But the fact of the matter is, if you're trying to make a living out of this business, you're competing with people like like you, Andrew, and people like me, you know, and we've got good equipment and we take a lot of pride in the quality of the sound. And if in the first five seconds, that client is hearing something that doesn't measure up to what other people are sounding like, you're dead in the water because uh, clients don't hire good. They hire great. Here's the other thing, Dan, and I'm interested to get your take on this, but this whole home studio thing. Well, I mean, I've had a a, a dedicated home studio here now for, look, a proper one for seven years. Um, I know Andrew's had his studio down in Melbourne there for what, about 10, Andrew? Would that be about right? Yeah, be about 10 years. Yeah, a bit more actually, yeah. My my take on this is this, right? That I've spent countless of thousands of dollars building this room. And Andrew, I know, has done similar, and I'm sure you've done the same. And I think this whole work from home in inverted commas thing is only just at the very beginning. I think it's only just starting to gain some acceptance. And I think we have a responsibility not only to sell our product as something that is the best it can be, but that whole idea we have a responsibility of selling that to clients as well. So all of a sudden it's not seen as, oh, well, that's just a home studio. It can't be anywhere near as good as what we do here. We want to try and change that perception as well. There's actually no difference whether it's done here or it's done at this home studio. Do you see that as part of your responsibility as well or you take a more personal attitude of, well, I'm I'm just selling me? No, I do take it as a personal responsibility for it, just for the for the craft itself, yeah, and for the in, and for the industry, yeah, uh, because because where the industry goes, um, it reflects on me as mm. as a voice talent, mm. and I don't even call my studio a home studio. I call it a personal studio, okay. uh, because the home studio conjures up this idea of somebody who's just off in a corner somewhere, maybe under a, uh, under some a flight of steps, and. You know, they've got a little makeshift studio mm. that they come up with that, mm. that doubles as a clothes hamper. And I, I, I'm i like you. I've spent mega amounts of money to build a good studio that we use. I've used. I don't anymore, but I used to use it for a to- full production. Yeah. Uh, full production for commercials and, and, and stuff like that. With, a, you know, I've got a huge library, a sound effects library. You know, I'm, I mean, I've got a, a nice... I mean, it's it's a very well developed studio. I only use it for voice work though anymore because mm-hmm. uh, I don't have time to do anything else. And fortunately, I'm in a place where I don't have to do anything else. I can just do voice work. Mm-hmm. So I, but it's my personal studio, and I treat it that way. And I'm very proud of the quality of the sound and um, and the equipment that I have, and the fact that I I didn't go cheap. This idea that you can buy cheap and get better. No, you buy good and then you upgrade. That's that's, right. that's the way you do it. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's um let's go back on an, on a uh, uh, on a subject matter that we talked about on this show a couple of weeks ago. Talk us through your um your mic chain, Dan. What are you running? Um. Well, I have a little USB mic that I run into my laptop. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> okay. Great. Brilliant. So um so what? <laughs> Apple no. earbud headphones? Would that be right? <laughs> I got some, yeah, buds. I got yeah. little buds here. Actually, only one, you know, because the other one's broken. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> um, right now, I'm running uh, uh, the Sennheiser 416. Yeah. Yep. And I'm running that into my uh, Avalon uh, 727. Yeah. And uh, then I run that uh, to my board. I don't, need, I don't out put any processing. Well, I do have a little bit of processing. I'll run about 2.5 or uh, 1 to 3 or one, uh, 3 to 1 or 2.5 to 1 compression, mm-hmm. um, standard. 
And it's only because I do it because of, of my room and the way I want to create the sound of my room. Um, mm-hmm. Then I, but if the client doesn't, you know, and sometimes some very seldom does a client say, oh, you know what? Are you running any compression? If they're hearing it, take it off. Not a problem. I'm yeah. happy to do that. Listen, the sound's just as, you know, still a good sound without it. Mm. And it's still a clean sound without it. But um, the fact of the matter is when you're auditioning, a lot of clients say, that's the sound I want. That's, yeah. you know, that's the quality that I want. And so that's, I just have a standard setting for that. Mm. Uh, I also have, are you familiar with the blue, uh, the blue mics, the blue bottle rockets? Yeah, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yep. Oh my God. I love that. Mic. I've got a blue bottle rocket with the uh, six capsule and I run that. Um, I, th- I have an, uh, the uh, Twinfinity, uh, the UA Twinfinity, or I'll run that through a Focusrite. I have a Focusrite Red 7. Mm, very um, nice. And so I'll run it through that, run it through, I have a Yamaha board. And, uh, just, yeah, that's, that's how I run it. That's, that's the equipment. And then if it ever needs any cleanup, uh, then I've got some onboard processing that I can use for, for doing some cleanup, but it very seldom has. The only thing I use usually in cleanup is a debreather from, uh, from Wave. Yeah. I'll yeah. use their little debreather program primarily for the, the corporate narration stuff or e-learning stuff. Yeah. So that was going to be my question. You send, you obviously send a tiny bit of clean up on your files rather than just a directly what's come off the mic? I do. I do yeah. clean it up a little bit. Uh, and I clean it up because, um, first of all, I do it as, as a favor to the engineer. Mm. Uh, and, and I, and I'll often ask the engineer, Hey, you want me to do just a little bit of cleanup, get all, you know, pops and, and, you know, mic ticks and or mouth ticks and that sort of thing out there. Like, yeah. Yeah. If you want to do that, that'd be great. Well, we can do it here, but you know, it's just simple for me to run through it. I know where everything is. I can run it. I mark it when I'm recording it mm. and uh, I can do that. And so if, if they're cool with that and they know the quality of my work, you know, they, I don't, I don't get any pushback hardly ever from an engineer, maybe a new engineer once in a while that doesn't know the kind of work that I do. But most of the engineers that I work with are all like, that'd be cool. That'd be great if you want to yeah. do that. Sometimes they'll ask me to put about five seconds of room noise at the end yeah. so that they can go pick it up and use it if they want to. Yeah. We're a pretty laid back bunch, really, us audio yeah. engineers. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, talking about room, talk about room <laughs> noise. Do you, is that what you want, Robbo? Do you would you like room noise when you get a file? Yeah, look, it can be helpful, absolutely. Especially if it's um, look. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm sitting here. It's a beautiful spring summer's day here in Sydney today. I'm sitting here with the window open and my Neumann in the middle of the room. So I'm sure <laughs> when we come to edit this, there's going to be a whole bunch of background noise as well. But um. Uh, yes, it, it is very helpful, especially if you, if the room does have a little bit of noise, a little bit of air conditioning rumble or something. Sometimes if it's, uh, especially if it's a commercial that you're going to use cold voice and you, you want to take the breaths out and you have nothing to replace those with, yes, it can be noticeable. So yes, it is. Oh, helpful, so you don't, you don't silence between, you don't silence out breaths or anything? I'll be honest. I, I don't de-breath this if it's a cold voice. If it's going to be a cold voice commercial, I think it sounds very robotic to take the breaths out. I reduce the level um, significantly, but I usually do leave them in, yes. Um, do, well, depending on, depending on obviously what the commercial is, but if it's, if it's a, you know, one person talking to, to camera, um, if it's a TV commercial, yes, I'll leave the breaths in. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's there's nothing worse than watching somebody take a breath and no sound. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> like, my God, what's happened? I know, but it, you know what? It's a um, I don't want to use the word amateur. It's it's a newbie mistake, shall we say? Because you do see it on the telly quite. I don't know, mm-hmm. especially late oh, yeah. night television, late night some of those infomercials that are obviously done in. You know, let's not say where, but you know, somewhere not very nice. Um, <laughs> wait, no, wait a minute. Now, this how that's how I make my living now. Be oh, careful. okay, that's right. <laughs> that's what the USB microphone's for. That's right. <laughs> I did an infomercial here, by the way. It's it's running on the air here in, in the United States right now. It's called Bidet Buddy. <laughs> oh, and, no. uh, <laughs> It's this oh, contraption dear. you put on your toilet and, uh, and it has a little hose that comes up, you know, and you, when you're ready for it, you fire it up and it just hoses you out, you know, and this oh, your Jesus, day, buddy. Oh, that's fraught with danger, isn't it? <laughs> oh, oh it's just, you know, you know, but wait, 
you know, <laughs> order now. You can get a second one free. And I'm going, what the hell would you do with a second one? I could just you hear know? the conversation. <laughs> Honey, the bidet buster's broken again. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I think about is the water's coming out of the toilet for crying out loud. It's cold water. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and do you really want to recycle that water? Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends what's in the water. I'm going to go. I'm going to find that on YouTube now. You've got my, you've tweaked my interest. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You should check out bidet, buddy. I'll tell you another one you should check out is. Uh, perfect Polly. Per- right. Perfect. Does she, does she perfect she Polly. No, she does it. She's a parrot. Right. <laughs> She's, just, we do Polly means something different here in the U.S. Right. So, yeah. So perfect Polly is a plastic bird mm. that uh, will tweet and her head jerks around like, you know, she's just a little canary. Yeah. And it's, she's, your, she's the perfect pet because she makes no mess or anything like that. <laughs> I'm telling you, it is the silliest commercial, and they they laughed all the way to the bank with that thing. Yeah, but uh, I uh, it that, that was one of my commercials, and yeah. <laughs> there you go. I got more people Don't calling me saying, "What did you did you d- you didn't do that?" You know, is it on your reel? No, well, <laughs> it's not on the reel. It's it, it. I do have a where did I put that? I, I have it on a website somewhere where it's right. You know, just shows shows it. But there was a movie that was made. I can't remember the name of the movie right now. But it was the first scene of the movie was that commercial. And oh, wow. that's how that's how the movie starts with that infomercial of Perfect Polly. <laughs> it's, yeah. got a, it's got a Quentin Tarantino <laughs> vibe about having that commercial at the opening of the movie. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Someone getting their so head I get a, shot I get, off. I get, well, I get royalties you? every once in a while of 13 cents, you know, for the movie. Hey. I don't think the I don't think the movie did very well. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not Tarantino then. <laughs> that's yeah, right, barely. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think with uh, that's been a most informative little program. I think so. We should do this again, actually. But uh, I've got one tip which I picked up during the week, which uh, it's a tip for young players. Mm. But uh, I've had a Source Connect account for uh, the last nine years, and uh, when I set up the account, I set it as my company name. Mm. And it's taken me all this time. I finally got a hold of Source Connect this week and I've just reset everything and upgraded everything. And I said, look, can I change my username? And they've done it for me. And so now it's actually got my name on, on there, my Source Connect account. So what I'm doing now with that is I, um, I always open up and log in to my Source Connect first thing I do in the morning because I know anyone that's got their Source Connect open are seeing me online. It's a constant reminder uh, that I'm here. There you go. Very look- nice. Little marketing tool there. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Nice tip, Mister Peters. Well done. Oh, thank you very much. What about you, Dan? What What would be um for for the people who are listening to our podcast? You know, we're trying to talk to people who are trying to break into voiceovers as well as people like yourself with mega experience. What would be your best tip to someone who's trying to break into the industry in terms of marketing and all that sort of stuff? Well, I my name on Facebook is Dan Hurst Voiceovers. Mm. And my name on LinkedIn, Stan Hurst voiceovers. I, and so what happens is anytime somebody either looks for voiceovers or types in you know, either LinkedIn or Facebook or is looking for uh, e-learning or commercials or something like that, that's going to pop up because it's in not only my name, but my description. And that really is important. Now, LinkedIn uh, has become one of my most successful resources for uh, connecting with new clients. It's a brilliant tool if you play it right and if you work it right. And the way you play it right is that you don't go looking for work. You go looking for relationships. Mm. And uh, you look for, uh, you know, creative directors that you want to build a connection with and just, hey, how are you? You know, and it's just, you know, and you touch base every, you know, two or three months. And eventually, if they have need of your services, they're going to go, hey, we got this coming up. Uh, would you be interested in, in auditioning for this? You'd be amazed how many jobs I get just by building those relationships on LinkedIn, mm. not going and saying, hey, if you ever need a voice talent, I'm your guy. You know, they don't want they don't. First of all, that's the wrong way to use social media. And secondly, it's intimidating and irritating to the decision makers. They're just not there. It's a good way to get yourself blacklisted. Mm. So you just build relationships. but. Uh, they have to find you. And so I, I'm similar to what, what Andrew has done there. I've done that with my Facebook and my LinkedIn uh, accounts. Mm, mm, that's a great tip. Yeah. It's a few things we have in common. Can hear Andrew um, writing I just it changed down all, 
Yeah, no, yeah. I changed all my um, new website was Andrew Peters VO. Uh, all my email account is Andrew Peters VO. My Facebook is Andrew Peters VO. Uh, and the other thing I've I noticed we have in common is um, on my uh, I think it's my Source Connect account. Uh, in the description, I call it a personal studio. Good for you. So there you go. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't call mine a home studio, but um, I just call it a studio. But, mm. uh, you know, I, I do, I, I, I am struggling to find a way to create that distinction because I don't want people sort of coming on board thinking that, you know, they're going to turn up to this studio that has three or four rooms and with, you know, catered lunches and, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff too. So, uh, Oh, you don't me, do that? Well, you know, I suppose I could <laughs> chuck a pie in the oven if you wanted one. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, here's here's another little tip that I do. I live in Kansas City. There's some great studios in Kansas City. Kansas City is a great voiceover town. And there's some great agencies, some great ad agencies, uh, not, not talent agencies, but great ad agencies and some great studios in this town. Mm. And I have a policy here that if I get hired by a local client, I do not do their work in my studio. I go to a local studio. Yeah, great. Because I don't want to compete with them. I want them to have a piece of the pie also. And also, I know that they're going to do a really, really good job. They're great studios. They do great work. And it's easier and better for the client to have that kind of connection. Because if they want to come back and change something, then and I've done it in my studio, then it's like, oh, man, i got to go through that whole process of yeah. you know, finding it and you know that sort of thing. So I only use local studios for local clients. Mm. Uh, when now, if the clients are out of town and they just want me to record something and send it to them, then obviously I'll use use my personal studio. But I'm not uh, I'm not going to do that for local clients. Yeah, I, look, I agree. I do the same thing. And the only time I ever work from here for uh, local studios is I still route straight to the studio. Um, yeah, and I become if, if the booth. studio requests it. You mean if the studio wants that? Yeah. If the studio said, "Hey, could you could you dial in directly to us and do that?" And and a lot of radio as well, even local radio. They, you know, they're yeah. happy for me not to go in but they, because they just got yeah. their studios are getting booked. They they've got stuff going through there all the time, and it frees yeah. them up. I, yeah, I, I will have local studios say, "Hey, you know, don't want you to have to come all the way over here just for this. You know, this thirty second spot. Can can we hook up with ISDN and 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 I'll do that. Um, but but that that comes from the studio, not you know, not from yeah. the client." It's interesting, actually, because I don't know whether this has happened to you, but I've actually hurt my back quite severely. And um, unfortunately, for the last few weeks, I haven't been able to um, drive into the city. Well, I could drive into the city, that's fine. It's actually the walk from the car to the studio, which is a problem. Wow. Uh, so I've been doing a bit of work from here remotely, which, you know, they're not overly happy about, but... Uh, Anyway, we got through it. But that 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 that's sort of stuff for another show, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I would if my back didn't hurt so much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, dear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good note to end with. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> we should leave that in. Because I've actually got a session in. 15 minutes anyway. How do you it's have a session? session? It's almost nine o'clock at night. How could you have a session? <laughs> oh, well, you know, 24 <laughs> seven, mate, global studio. That's me. Oh man. You know, yeah, you're yeah. such demand. That's right. Everybody that's wants a piece of Robbo. <laughs> yeah. They do hey, what indeed. a pleasure guys. Thank you so much for, yeah, this was for good fun. In, in, inviting yeah, it was me. And I, and I, I really appreciate it. Do you know exactly. what? I've been really slack this. I, I'm actually, <laughs> I did. I'm not even in the booth. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you've known the same I've been really slack. I've got, I've got uh, just the shoddy, out here by the computer. So. Mm. so I'm the only one on a Neumann today, am I? Is that right? It looks like it. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Yep. I, bring out the, I bring out the good cutlery and everyone else brings out the plastic <laughs> knives and forks. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Which Neumann are you running? <laughs> Just a 103. Oh, yeah. So, That's yeah. not a $2,500 mic. Come on. No. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it is, let me tell you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Geez. Things are expensive here. <laughs> Mate, we, pay, I, like, we were having this conversation the other day. I pay $100 Australian for my cell phone, right? I get unlimited Nash phone calls around the country. I get seven gigabytes of data a month. Um, and unlimited text messages. Now, a mate of mine has just moved to LA and she was telling me, and you might confirm this, she pays $100 a month over there for unlimited calls anywhere around the globe and unlimited data. Does that sound about right to you? Uh, I'm paying 55 for that. Well, there you go. <laughs> Even $55. more to my point then. So yeah, we yeah. get ripped off 
iTunes songs over here average about two dollars sixty, I think, to, to three dollars. I think oh, you guys really? get oh, them. My. Yeah. So everything over here is twice the price, and they justify it by saying, "Well, we have to, um, you know, we have to get it there in the first place." No, we have well, to ship it. Oh, it's, no, on the, it's online. What are you talking about? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's crazy. There's actually been a yeah. government inquiry into it just recently. And there should oh, be. really? That's right. <laughs> Hang on. My daughter's just walked into the room. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's interesting. I, for the, just to give you an idea of what we pay, my ISDA, ISDN lines, just to rent the lines, is $100 a month. Uh, my internet, two mobile phones and a landline is $375 a month. So, you know, that's what's well, up. Now, my ISDN is $260 a month. Really? So, wow. Yeah. yeah, 200. And they, they're trying they to raise it out, aren't they? I mean, it, it was like 160 or something, and they raised it to 260. And uh, they didn't care. If you don't like it, tough. Yeah. 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 Do, you, do you pay for calls as well, though? I do not. Well, like, no, I don't. I mean, I ask for uh, clients to, to dial in. I have, you know, I've got long distance, and I've never used it, ever. Yeah. No. You know, in, in I don't I, know how many years I've had it now. Yeah, I just never a session. dialed out. I don't know. I don't even know if I could, I, if I knew how. I yeah, I've dialed out. I dialed out to Jim actually in New York. We were online for an hour, and I got the bill for that hour on ISDN mm-hmm. was two hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah. Ouch. <laughs> you just go. And that was an international yeah, ISDN, wasn't it? Yeah, but wow. Yeah. You know, it's a telephone mm-hmm. line for God's sake. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shocker. Right. I hate to be a pain in the bum. Can we close right. this up? Well, you have to know. All right. Yeah, so, know. Um, well, you've got a that's bad the end of the show. Though, so that Let's, counts that out. We better, <laughs> we better do a sign off, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of another VO radio show. Dan Hurst, thank you very much for joining us from Kansas City. Yeah. Man, thanks, what Dan. a pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. It's good fun. We We're should do get it you again. Back. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah you guys talk back. funny. Have anybody told you that? Yeah. There's some <laughs> yeah. something about some, an accent or something, but, you know, I don't, re- yeah. I don't hear one. No, I haven't got an accent. <laughs> That's not an accent. All right, gents, I better keep moving. Thanks, Dan. Talk to you soon, hey? Thank you, guys. Cheers, Dan. See you guys. Bye. The VO Radio Show is produced in the studios of Voodoo Sound. To polish your next audio production, check us out at voodoo-sound.com. Find professional voices simply all in one place. Realtimecasting.com, including me.